This video is sponsored by The Dailies. Director and legend Martin Scorsese has made countless classic films throughout his decades-long career, and Killers of the Flower Moon is no exception. At the age of 80, with the director's career likely winding down, there's no telling how many more of his productions and films we will be able to watch, enjoy, and analyze in the coming years. Killers of the Flower Moon presents us with another fascinating production of his to take a look at from his meticulous filmmaking, deep understanding of his characters, and challenges he's never faced in his more than 50 years of filmmaking. So. Let's get into the 165 day production of Killers of the Flower Moon. The movie originated as an adaptation of the book Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. And the craze around this book created what Deadline called the biggest and wildest book rights auction in memory, involving numerous competitors such as Paramount, Sony, New Regency, Warner Brothers, Netflix, and more. Everyone from the blockbuster to the indie scene wanted their hands on this story. In the end though, Imperative Entertainment a newcomer to the industry just being established in 2014, bought up the rights for $5 million in 2016. The book tells the story of J. Edgar Hoover, the first director of the FBI, in his days as investigator for its predecessor, the Bureau of Investigation, attempting to solve a conspiracy of murders related to the oil business, and Imperative believed that it was a narrative worthy of an A-list cast and crew, looking to recruit Martin Scorsese to direct Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro to star. The initial plan was that production could begin in 2019, but progress on this movie muddled along slowly, with the trio deciding to focus on the development of the Irishman and instead. <laughs> 2019 turned out to be a year of pre-production for the movie, with Imperative arranging a deal with one of the runners-up in their bidding war over the original book, Paramount, to finance and distribute the upcoming movie. With the financials in place, DiCaprio and De Niro confirmed their attachment to the film, and cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto announced that principal photography was expected to start in March 2020. But of course, we all know what happens next. We have a new name for the coronavirus. The World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19. With the COVID pandemic at its infancy, the film quickly ended up in financial trouble, with Paramount reportedly growing weary of a steadily growing budget, estimated in April 2020 to be over $200 million. The spiraling costs forced Scorsese to reach out to other studios to rescue the production, with potential names at the time including Netflix and Apple. And of those two, Apple was selected to aid in the financials, leading to an Apple TV Plus distribution for the film as an Apple original. And this is quite an interesting development for Scorsese, because he's known as someone who really isn't a fan of streaming platforms at all. Only a year after the deal in 2021, he penned an essay called To Maestro to Harper's Magazine, denouncing a lot of the impact streaming platforms have had on the industry, particularly his view that art forms were being boiled down into generic content for business by figures with no knowledge of the art, with human curation being replaced with mindless algorithms, leaving him unsure of what cinema was becoming. No matter what you think of streamers, you can't deny the irony in the so-called digital destroyers of art coming to the rescue of Scorsese's art. <laughs> Killers of the Flower Moon was majorly rewritten during the pre-production process, and this accounted for some of the added cost, for which Leonardo DiCaprio's role changed majorly from depicting an FBI agent into the character he portrays in the final iteration of the film, as it was revealed in the Cannes press conference. We, we, we touched upon it after having myself and Eric Roth and, and uh, all of us together trying to get the story um, expressed uh, from the point of view of the... Um, of the Bureau of Investigation coming in. And I, I said, well, I think the audience is ahead of us. They know it's not a who done it, who, it's who didn't do it. And, and at, at one point, and this is after two years of working on the script, at one point, Leo came to me and he was gonna play Tom White. Yeah, that Jesse plays. And um, he said to me, where's the heart of this story? DiCaprio was instrumental in asking for the script change, as Scorsese mentioned, asking for an overhaul, and in the process of rewriting it, Scorsese realized that they were taking the wrong approach, with Scorsese telling Time Magazine that he realized during this process that I was making a movie about all of the white guys, meaning I was taking the approach from the outside in, which concerned me. With this realization, he switched up his approach. And I had had some meetings with uh, the Osage and some dinners at Grey Horse, and uh, of course in Pahoska, and uh, they got up and spoke. And I learned a lot about them in those three hours. 
I learned about the people themselves and, and the stories and all related to each other and there's still relations and there's still issues and so-and-so was in love, no he wasn't, yes she was, no, and it goes on like that. And I said, well, there's the story. The story is in the character that the least is written about, Ernest. And of course, that's what Leo wanted to do. And in this time, Scorsese was also inspired by Ari Aster's work in The Midsummer and Bo is Afraid, specifically the style and pacing of those horror films that he would integrate into how they would film Killers of the Flower Moon, allowing scenes that were not narrative into the story to be sure to capture the Osage culture. But it was during this writing process, in part thanks to COVID, that it was decided it might be best to tackle the film The Irishman first, especially due to their use of de-aging technology. And we had planned this picture back, I think actually we planned to do it before Irishman at one point. And then you said, oh no, the Irishman, we already have to, we have to uh, uh, do the CGI de-aging. It's going to get worse if we late, wait, uh, wait later. So you're right. So we did Irishman first. You know, productions like these can get very complicated and it makes a lot of sense, especially with a $200 million budget you're trying to work with and make money on. And when covering these productions, we meticulously present all of our research on our database that you can check out in the link here below in the description. Some of our Frame Voyage writers even leave little sassy corrections in there if I made a mistake. But when it comes to telling these stories of the production of films, it can be hard to keep up with everything happening in the industry from week to week to find more stories to tell in our videos. And that's where our sponsors, The Dailies, is extremely helpful. The Dailies is Hollywood's fast-growing email newsletter that now reaches 15,000 entertainment industry professionals with a quick five-minute newsletter about what's going on in the industry, giving you a quick snapshot of anything important and noteworthy, which I love that it goes into detail on some of the big stories and then gives you the quick hit details of smaller things like projects and development, which is super helpful for us when we want to mark for later use for a potential story. Their readers include producers, directors, actors, managers, agents, and top executives and work at companies you know like Disney, Paramount, Netflix, Warner Brothers, Lionsgate, Amazon, you name it. And the best part about this newsletter? It's completely free. You can click the link below in the description to sign up right now. Now let's get back to the production of Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> Production began in April 2021, under difficult circumstances during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the team could finally get their hands dirty soon, with costumes sorted out and final casting decisions made. A shooting period from February to September that year would start, and that with a 55,000 square foot production space rented in the Osage County, Killers of a Flower Moon would turn out to become a product of epic proportions. With a 400 man and woman crew building sets, clothing characters and operating lights, microphones, and cameras, A-list celebrities, an army worth of extras with some days on set requiring 8,000 people, and the Killers of the Flower Moon involving a story surrounding Native Americans. All of this was being done with cooperation and consultation from the Osage tribe people, including Chief Standing Bear, who was greatly invested in the retelling of the Killers of the Flower Moon story. Early on, I asked Mr. Scorsese, how are you going to approach the story? And he said, I'm going to tell a story about trust on, between Molly and Ernest, trust between the outside world and the Osage, and a betrayal of those trusts, deep betrayal. And uh, my people uh, suffered greatly, and to this day, to this very day, those effects are with us. But I can't say on behalf of the Osage, Marty Scorsese and his team have restored trust and we know that trust will not be betrayed. Trust in handling a movie about indigenous tribes with a respectful and faithful representation of culture is paramount for a historical film, which is why the collaboration between the filmmaker and the Osage people was sought out from the beginning. The, the first thing when uh, the, the book was presented to me and the, the script, I automatically understood. I said, well, if we go anywhere near indigenous uh, nations, we have to be very, very respectful, I gotta tell you. I mean, you just have a first meeting with the Chief Standing Bear, and then you have another meeting, and you have a dinner, and they say, they get up and they, they, and they say a prayer, and there's a ritual, and I was so moved. And this is what grounded me, and I knew what I heard, what their values are about love and respect and loving the earth, really understanding how to live on this planet. Uh, I found that the values were so important to me. And I, it, it reoriented me every time they spoke. 
From a cinematography perspective, Rodrigo Prieto, the director of photography for this film, who actually filmed, you know, small movies you've never heard of, like Barbie, Wolf of Wall Street, Brokeback Mountain, Taylor Swift's Cardigan music video. You know, nothing fancy. He spoke with the Movies Times at the premiere of the film discussing how the Osage culture actually influenced his cinematography. As a cinematographer, understanding the um, relation of the Osage people with, with nature, for example, was a very important thing because uh, it meant that I, I shot certain scenes at times of day that were specific to the moments where the Osage do their rituals, for example, or pray to the sun, uh, rising sun and at, at, at dawn, right after dawn, or, or a funeral happens at noon, so that's a time of day we shot it. You know, so it was really understanding that relationship with, with the na natural world. The landscapes and way of thinking surrounding the cinematography of nature and the way they used it actually sounds similar to another Scorsese and Prieto film in Silence, where they really let the surrounding nature take precedence and stripped away anything that was unnecessary from each scene. But it's a fascinating idea to really follow a cultural approach for the principal cinematography's stylistic tone. It's a very particular kind of landscape, uh, very open, very relatively flat, you know, there are hills and all that, which influence our framing. We, we decided a, a wide aspect ratio, uh, anamorphic lenses, so it's a widescreen movie, and that is because of the landscape. Prieto also spoke of developing techniques with lighting to be much more contrasted to cue viewers into the exploration of darkness of the human spirit, or the secrets beneath the waters of the world, stylistically helping to set the tone of the film. Also helping to set up the tone of the film were some experiments that they had tried with the ever-evolving script, namely throwing out ideas of trying to use infrared cameras before settling down on something fairly similar to Oppenheimer. Sí, de hecho quise diferenciar la perspectiva de los, digamos, descendientes de los europeos, ¿no? de los blancos, digamos, eh, visualmente, de la perspectiva de los Osage. Entonces, todas las escenas que son exclusivamente Osage, sus ceremonias o los momentos que están ellos con sus familias y sin los blancos, el color es totalmente naturalista. Fue con los descendientes de europeos, lo hice, hice una técnica que eh, re, reproduce en los inicios del color. Por eso se ve como desaturado, medio sepia, digamos. Es un, un sistema de color que se llama autochrome. Entonces, así separé esos dos mundos. Pero llega un momento en que hay un momento muy dramático en la historia donde todo se convierte en todos. Ahora están con el, un color desaturado y con alto contraste por el drama que están viviendo. ¿no? Entonces, trato de con la fotografía representar a cada grupo y luego también el drama emocional. To make this historical movie happen, however, consultation wasn't enough. Loads of extras had to be hired, in addition to around 4,000 Osage people. Even more extras were required for the making of the film. Luckily, we got a bit of an insight into how a movie extra can get employed and what their work looks like from a first-hand account. I'm just a regular Oklahoma boy, just like you. I've never been in a movie. I saw the, an ad on our local news. Said, hey, if you want to be a part of this, you know, long story short, I got chosen. Next thing you know, they said, they contacted me, said, you need to go to Bartlesville, Oklahoma. They're going to get you set up with uh, costumes. The extras would soon get their costumes, hair and makeup sorted out, having a certain responsibility on keeping their haircut and beards just the way they are for the final shooting days. They were constantly on their toes and always present on set. Really, it was a tough production for everyone involved. Making a $200 million film come to fruition during a pandemic is no easy task. And for the actors and extras, crew of the director, Scorsese, was especially at risk too. With him having asthma, getting ill from COVID could have been a life-endangering affair for him. And with 8,000 people around some days, it must have been a concern. We had COVID uh, working conditions, masks, uh, masks on, masks off. Everyone was vaccinated. Uh, you know, uh, Adam, Adam Sumner's our co-producer, and Dan Loopy is a producer here, and Bradley and everybody. I didn't feel as much of, of um, a disturbance in terms of, like, not being able to do certain things uh, because of the COVID restrictions. We worked with them very well, I thought. All you guys did... Beautifully. I just followed what you guys told me to do on that. With the pandemic in full swing, certain filming methods couldn't be done without workarounds either. And a big source of anxiety for cinematographers such as Rodrigo Prieto was the prospect of filming not being possible at the time of COVID, prompting him and the crew on set to work incredibly cautiously. Interestingly enough, some camera tricks and safety protocols used for the shoot of The Killers of the Flower Moon were first prototyped in a shoot of Taylor Swift's Cardigan music video, with Rodrigo Prieto promising that he and his crew would wear face shields and that social distancing rules 
rules would be taken seriously, even having a health inspector on the premises disinfecting props, and the music video was successfully filmed without anyone getting sick. And Rodrigo Prieto would make use of remote camera heads mounted onto a crane to get up and close and personal to his subject. On set, various cameras were used. For motion pictures, we can see airy film cameras. However, we believe that this movie didn't just make use of trusty old film cameras. The first hint we found on IMDb, with the Aerie Mini being listed alongside an Aerie Cam LT and an Aerie Cam ST. Granted, IMDb isn't the most reliable source on, you know, camera gear for production out there, but Aerie themselves gave the confirmation with this PDF on Aerie.com, which lists off equipment used on the production shown off in the Cannes Film Festival. And there it is, Killers of the Flower Moon is listed and according to Aerie, made use of the digital Aerie Mini cinema camera. But why would this camera be used? IMDB also lists that some scenes were shot in black and white, a creative decision by Martin Scorsese, which was mentioned previously by Prieto, with how they use the different formats to signify different cultural groups and periods of time. So based on the fact we've not seen any film specs showing black and white film, either that was done with a digital airy camera or in a post-production on the film itself. But I would expect by far that this film was filmed with film cameras. And continuing through production, for the most part, this production hummed along, with the exception of Robert De Niro injuring his leg before filming, but that didn't really slow down this film's production, which would wrap up on October 1st, 2021, wrapping up 165 days of production and returning only to film additional footage of traditional community dances the next year before moving into post-production. The final edit of Killers of the Flower Moon reportedly was something truly impressive, coming in at a 3.5 hour runtime and the film receiving a standing ovation at the Cannes Film Festival. It also received rave reviews from critics. If the tomato meter is anything to go by, this one is a hit. Although Scorsese has had to go up against criticism, the film's very lengthy runtime of three and a half hours, which he justified by calling out binge watching of TV, saying, people, it's three hours, but come on, you can sit in front of your TV and watch something for five hours, insisting that cinema should be given some level of respect as well. And I think we can all point to many a film over the past decade that has felt rushed and edited down to not even making sense anymore just to get down to some arbitrary number. And speaking of a fascinating production resulting in a film that could have benefited from a longer runtime and potentially a TV show adaptation, the creator, check out our video on its production here.